Good afternoon to all of you. My name is Kunda Bosse. I am the coordinator of Hypeak, and I would like to welcome you in this um, Hypeak uh, Computing Systems webinar, uh, the series that we run out twice a week um, while the COVID uh, pandemic is still among us. Um, so I'm very pleased uh, for this afternoon uh, to introduce to you uh, Luca Benini. Um, Luca Benini uh, got his um, degree from University of Bologna. Then he went for a PhD at the Stanford University. And since then, he got several um, visiting and other position, professor positions at universities Stanford, EPFL, Bologna. And uh, today, he's full professor of digital circuits and systems at the University of Zurich. Hmm. Um, Luca Benini is known for many things that he did in his career uh, already. So I just checked his Google Scholar H index is 110. Um, and just this is a very high number in our domain. Just for comparison, Dave Patterson from Berkeley University has 116. And Albert Einstein has 119. So he belongs to that category. Mere mortals have more something like 70, 60, 50, 40. Etc. So we are in very good company for this uh, for today's keynote and, and webinar. And um, Luca is has been involved recently in uh, Risk Five architecture, and he's promoting Risk Five um, uh, here in Europe for sure. And today he will talk about uh, acceleration of data parallel workloads from IoT to HPC. Luca, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Kun. Um, so welcome to my, my talk uh, and um, let's uh, get going. Um, okay, so um, I guess the um, overall motivation of uh, the work that uh, we're going to discuss today is the quest for energy efficiency in computing. Now, energy efficiency is the main challenge today at the exascale for the exascale computers. The reason is that we have uh, more or less an infrastructure bound around 20 megawatts uh, for powering a supercomputer. And, uh, and that means that if we want to keep growing our uh, power in terms of computational capability, we have uh, under a fixed bound in terms of power, it means that we have to improve our energy per operation. So as you know, the exact scale is uh, behind the corner. And uh, if you just do the math, it means that if you have to power an exascale scale computer with uh, quote unquote, just 20 megawatts, you have to uh, deliver a flop in uh, uh, 20 picojoule, which is uh, you know, quite massive. And if you want to go beyond the exascale. scale, this means that you have to improve uh, proportionally your energy efficiency because uh, your uh, power consumption for a supercomputer is kind of hard bound around a uh, uh, few tens of megawatts. Now, um, in the past, these uh, um, capabilities of increasing the energy efficiency was, was helped by Moore's law. Uh, but, um, you know, Around 15 years ago, this uh, nice uh, power scaling that was coming uh, with the area scaling with Moore's law, known as the NARS scaling, uh, just uh, stopped. So now we do have a fairly healthy Moore's law. And you would be surprised to see that uh, there, is, there are quite concrete plans to keep scaling for another 10 years uh, along uh, uh, the lines of Moore's law. Unfortunately, while uh, scaling in terms of dimensions uh, seems to be, you know, uh, along the lines of Moore's law for the next 10 years, we already stopped a uh, long time ago to scale proportionally the power. So basically, if you look uh, right now, if you take a snapshot that right now we are in the five nanometer node and you project yourself in two years from now, according to the SMC, uh, Moore's law is pretty solid in the third three nanometers node, we will get uh, an almost perfect uh, uh, Moore's law logic density increase uh, of 1.7 X, but only 27% power down, which basically means that if we want to have an equal area chip, maximum reticle chip, that is what we need to deliver maximum computational capability, the power goes up by 24%. 
uh, even with scaling. So in other words, uh, scaling doesn't help us to keep uh, the energy efficient, uh, the energy uh, constant, and even worse, it will not help making it better. So what can we do to improve the performance? The other big uh, problem that we uh, have to handle is that uh, computing systems like uh, based on instruction processors can improve improve performance by, for example, running faster and moving to a more complex microarchitecture. But uh, they usually do so at price in terms of efficiency. So here I'm taking a, a picture not from the high performance, but for from the low power space. I'm looking into processors that are microcontrollers, a simple processors, M0+, plus, M4, M M7. And as you can see, there is an unpleasant trade-off between uh, the energy-efficient MCUs, like the M0+, Plus, which has a very high energy efficiency and low performance, and the more high-performance MCUs that have a better performance but worse energy efficiency. So traditional microarchitecture techniques that improve the performance for a microprocessor by making it super scalar, deeply pipelined, more complex, are definitely not the direction that we want to take to improve our energy efficiency or just even to compensate the energy efficiency loss that we are going to see over time. And remember that we want to achieve high performance at high energy efficiency. So that's fundamentally why we say that today uh, computing system design is an energy efficiency game, delivering good uh, GOPS or teraops at a very low power. How can we do that? So, we have to look into workload. So, one important, uh, you know, general a mega trend um, direction is that people are looking into how you make your architecture. Uh, better and more efficient, not in the general sense, but you specialize it to a compute domain. So we are talking about the domain specific computation. And uh, today, fortunately, there are very uh, quite a limited amount of domains that are uh, large enough to uh, amortize the cost of uh, uh, developing architectures specifically for this domain. One, probably the most important one that is coming now uh, across the border of uh, all uh, computer architectures from the tiny IoT uh, processors to the huge uh, cloud processors is AI. And in fact, we can see here that if we look into the top accuracy AIs for ImageNet that achieves 90, more than 90% 90 accuracy on the ImageNet, this is a typical uh, high performance workload, billions of parameters, many giga operations per second for a single round of, of uh, inference. On the other hand, even if you look at the tiny deep neural networks that are used in mobile phones or even in IoT devices, uh, you see that these networks are much uh, tinier in terms of size, but still, they require quite a lot of uh, performance and energy efficiency. In fact, at uh, you know, the scale, the large scale, we need to uh, provide affordable exaflops for training and running massively in parallel inference. Uh, at the tiny ML uh, in the IoT space, we need to fit uh, a uh, smaller but still uh, um, computationally demanding neural network in the power budget of a microcontroller unit, so a few milliwatts. And so it's an energy efficiency challenge across the board. But since this is a very transversal workload, we can actually um, try to optimize an architecture for it. The point I'm making here, besides the uh, neural network uh, uh, specialization, is that not all programs are created equal. And in fact, processors can do two kinds of useful work. Decide, in a sense, uh, jump to different program parts, modulate the flow of instructions. This is really 
control. Lot of decision, limited number crunch rating system. You do some operating system work. In that case, you are, um, in that case, uh, you are not so much interested in having a big capability of number crunching, but uh, you are more interested in sequential behavior, have the big compute. So we have a massive amount of data and you have to mostly do diligence work, which essentially mean, means just uh, perform a similar amount of operations, similar class of operations on a very large data set. Many of today's challenges, including machine learning, are kind of the diligence type of work. So tons of data, algorithm has to just to flow through, and a few decisions are based on the computer variable. This can also talk about this as data oblivious algorithm for optimizing architectures too. RISC-5, which is in the title of my presentation. RISC-5 is a modern, free ISA, extensible by construction, meaning that your ISA has a zoned space for defining custom extensions for a specific use. And most importantly, it is endorsed by a very large number of companies. It is a truly international, uh, and in fact, uh, RIS-5 uh, moved to Zurich from the United States to have an even more neutral and uh, balanced international positioning. Now, this has actually changed the picture on computing systems research. Why? Why RIS-5 is a game changer? As I said, there are technical reasons. The nice ISA design, pretty modern. It has been... Uh, um, Sensibility, but it also has uh, non technical reasons, like it is patent troll if it has been uh, analyzed for patent freedom, and it also on this huge momentum point. The Super S5 is uh, so good for research, heavily supported in terms of software, chains, system tools, language runtime, operating systems. All this is actually free open software is available on RIS-5. Having such a huge support means that you can innovate and at the same time have a lot of legacy supported, which is what you need for a successful computing system development. Now, let me get into the technical part. So how can we use RIS-5 to make a microprocessor more energy efficient not only higher performance, but more energy efficiency, efficient. So let's start from a small use case. Let's start from a simple, and simple microcontroller, three side in order pipeline with the four cycle at uh, for data oblivious, uh, data, in the, data independent control flow. Uh, how can we use the specialization of uh, the ISA, thanks to the freedom we have in the, in the encoding space, to improve the efficiency of RISC-5 for this class of algorithms? First of all, is it already okay? Actually, it is not. In fact, uh, it is a, a fairly good uh, general purpose ISA, but it has not been tuned for uh, machine learning or other data oblivious type of algorithms. So we did work in this direction starting uh, or, or six years ago. We started to extend the uh, ISA without violating backward compatibility using the extension space you have in the ISA. We started adding things like hardware loop, post-modified load and stores, multiply accumulate instruction. And then we added further specialization, for example, for uh, CIMD, uh, low bit width precision, uh, bit manipulation, lightweight point that are essential for efficient appearance. 
when they have support instructions. The score is around 40 kilo gauge. And this 40 kilo gauge, you have to notice the file and uh, data path. So where most of the hardware is spent uh, in uh, what uh, is city of baseline uh, core that only supports the standard instruction set. This is actually an increase of a factor of 1.6. So are we making a mistake? Are we making this core larger and uh, not energy efficient? Because as you know, power at high utilization is uh, related with area. So let's look at it. This is our uh, on RV32 IMC, the baseline is five instruction set. If you add the hardware loops, you eliminate the, the, uh, the control hazards. You start adding load and cost increment. Here, all your instruction implicit in the load and store operations. If you use, you decrease significantly the number of operations by adding a specific instruction that performs the Cindy dot product in a 32-bit accumulated variable. So this is nine times less instructions than RV2 IMC for the same functionality. Can we do even better? And for example, can we aim to full utilization, 100% utilization of your dot product unit, which is actually the computation we have to do? Yes, we can we have to add uh, specific instructions that look like a super scalar, but they are not, because in a single instruction, you can combine the uh, dot product and the access to a memory location. We call this uh, dot products plus uh, load work. And since uh, the dot product and the load store unit are two different units in your uh, processors, they can be used concurrently thanks to hardware parallelism. And so we get a, a very significant improvement in terms of efficiency, almost 1.7 cycle reductions at a very modest increase in area, only a bit of control because the two units are already present. So, to summarize, we made the power 1.6 uh, larger, but we made performance 10 times better. Hence, we are energy efficient. Now, how can we go for higher of one architecture? We achieve 100% utilization of the computer, but we are not doing the teraflops or the teraops. Then we have to go parallel. And the idea that we explored in the last five years is what we call parallel near threshold. And the idea is to exploit the technology, to operate our devices in a region where the speed is not the highest, actually it's pretty low, but the energy efficiency is high. It's a peak. Because as you know, if we decrease the voltage, power, we need to start to dominate the leakage. But if you stop the earlier, then we have an optimal energy efficiency. And this energy efficiency point, we have the optimal technology-driven efficiency of our, of our architecture. Then if we parallelize execution, we can get to the performance through parallelization. Of course, parallelization, the parallel work that we have been discussing so far is actually highly parallel. I would say embarrassing parallel and scalable. In the percentage of parallelism will grow. And so there is no amdal effects that prevents us to parallelize. We are getting performance at the optimal energy efficiency point. So parallel architecture starting from our small, tiny microcontroller. Well, it's a conceptual, it's easy. This is easy, right? We put a few of these guys in parallel, but uh, there is where the easy stops. Because, uh, you know, this concept of the cluster, we needed to provide access to this, uh, uh, to memory, 
L1 memory, so the fast memory to these uh, processors in an efficient way so that they can access memory concurrently without blocking each other. To do that, we need to develop a logarithmic interconnect that provides a many-to-many -many, uh, access from many processors to memory memory banks. And we actually imp implement these mem many memory banks as interleaved memory so that accesses to contiguous uh, zones in the memory space can go to different memory banks. And so we can have concurrently in the memory access. If we minimize the banking conflicts, then we will have a highly parallel uh, load and store uh, access. That's what we actually want. Moreover, in order to have efficiency, we need to manage synchronization and data movement between the uh, level one memory and the level two memories, the IOs, and we have to perform this in parallel with the execution of the uh, of uh, our uh, course. In order to perform this in non-blocking way, without losing efficiency, if that we would lose if we start using uh, um, cache coherent uh, um, caches on the data, we do explicit memory copies, and we exploit the fact that most of that the parallel programs that we are targeting are highly predictable in terms of access patterns. So we can double buffer our memory transfers, which basically means we can use a DMA, which can be programmed ahead of time. And the DMA will start moving the data from the higher level of the memory hierarchy into the inner memory that we need. And then we, use, we need to use also faster hardware synchronization to make sure that we can keep the cores and the DMA synchronized and working in parallel using uh, iterative double buffering so that we can achieve maximum utilization of the processors and at the same time keep our memory stall minimal because we hide the latency of uh, longer access to remote memories thanks to the double buffering. Besides that, we needed to be careful because our instruction memory fetch bandwidth increases proportionally to the number of processors. So we needed to design a, a very opportunistic a cache hierarchy where we locally buffer in the RIS-5 cores a small amount of data so that the local fetches are mostly amortized by local caches. And then we can have a common share cache where we exploit the fact that the data computation is similar to different data items. So there is a lot of reuse in your code. And with this share cache, we can also reduce the amount of duplication in the local caches. So we need a hierarchical, partially private and uh, partially shared cache to minimize the instruction fetch cost. Good. So does it work? Well. A mod to, uh, if you scale here, as you can see from one core to eight cores, our workload in the, in the in example that we are carrying over eight bit convolutions, we have almost a linear speed up. We have the 10x speed up due to domain specialization, thanks to our uh, free and extensible architecture, uh, ISA and micro architecture. And then we can get almost linear speed up the parallel applications that we are targeting thanks to the very efficient parallel architectures that we have designed with efficiency in mind. Of course, uh, there is a, to have a full system, you don't only need to have an architecture, a parallel cluster, you also need to do deal with the control uh, part of your applications, the offloading, the synchronization with the IOs and things like that. This part is not computational demanding, but then you need a hybrid architecture, heterogeneous architecture, where you have control core that manages a acceleration domains that we call a cluster. So this heterogeneous architecture where you have a um, small amount of computation and control done on a, a serial part of the architecture, the big bulk of the computation done on a parallel part of the architecture is achieving flexibility and energy efficiency. Now, this is not a concept on paper. It has been designed, it has been made in many chips, and it's also open source. And you can download it from GitHub uh, since 2017. This is also another great thing about RIC5. It allows you to do so. You can do open hardware based on an open ISA. Of course, I'm not going to talk about uh, software a lot in this talk, but domain-specific uh, applications also have a, a huge opportunity 
in the software space. In fact, this is showing the full uh, stack that we developed for mapping neural networks. So that's the domain specific uh, um, environment for neural network mapping that goes from a high level description of the neural network in NXX or PyTorch, and then performs in a semi-automated way the, uh, all the tasks that bring the code to execution from the specification data set selection to the training, quantization and pruning, graph optimization, memory aware deployment, so with the orchestration of the data traffic and the tiling of our networks, and finally a highly optimized library with the exploitation of the extended instruction set. So all this stack is also open source and available, and it is a demonstration that uh, coupling a domain specific architecture with a domain specific software stack, you can achieve a very high end to end efficiency for your application. Okay. Now, the um, the hunger for more performance and more energy efficiency is uh, extreme. But the flexibility we can push further our efficiency uh, without compromising flexibility. We know how to push efficiency. Uh, efficiency can be used by specializing hardware. We can improve our efficiency by developing a specialized hardwired acceleration for specific functions that are the computational um, bottleneck in our application your accelerator that could work as a specialized module for then how can we make a hardware accelerator efficient accelerator it has to be dealt with similar to a dma it can be configured and it can run in parallel with the uh, general purpose cores and can synchronize with them and access memory in parallel. This is what we call the zero copy interaction. So the hardware accelerator works together with the course into a shared memory system, L1 memory system. Now, this helps reducing the cost copies between a software managed part of the algorithm, a hardware managed part of the algorithm, which we call zero copy hardware software copy. Now, what makes a hardware processing engine better in terms of energy efficiency than a processor? Well, let's think about it. Fundamentally, there are a few aspects. Uh, some are in the data plane and some are in the control plane of our hardware accelerator. We remember that we plug our hardware accelerator into the memory system through address generation plug and through a register file and control logic on the control plane. Now, where we get the efficiency from? I think you know. Hardware efficiency is obtained with respect to it to an even and optimized RISC V core is obtained through specialized data path. For example, a systolic MAC where you have a processing element to processing element a direct communication without going through memory to internal specialized storage, for example, line buffers in, instead of memory banks, to dedicated control, because uh, we have uh, a, you know, a specific function like a multiply accumulate or dot products, and we don't need to, trans to transform it into a sequence of instructions. So we don't need to have uh, instruction decoding instruction fetch, and we reduce the uh, overhead due to this part of the architecture. And finally, we can also specialize the interconnect between the um, L1 shared memory and uh, the accelerator, uh, specialize it to the type of computation the accelerator does. For example, linear access, linear strided access of arrays. So all these uh, specialization techniques uh, help us improving the efficiency of the hardware wrapper. But there are more things that we can do. For example, we can further specialize our accelerator to an application domain. For neural networks, for example, we can uh, specialize an accelerator for binary computations. 
As you know, binary computations are extremely efficient in terms of memory footprint and in terms of calculations because we remove multiplications and we replace them with the logic operations like XOR in the case of XORnet. And so we have a much higher efficiency in terms of uh, work, uh, of, um, picojoule per unit of uh, uh, operation. On the other hand, binary neural networks are very strict, are very limited in terms of flexibility. So we can uh, define accelerators that mix specialization and flexibility. And this is an example where we can, uh, how we can do it. Here you can see our binary computation can be transformed into a multi-bit computation by fundamentally understanding that a many bit product can be transformed and be split into several binary bits, uh, bit products with shift operations, add and shift operations on the various bit lanes. And in this way, we can fundamentally create a very flexible accelerator. Depending on how we want to use our binary product engines uh, with or without a shift and add, we can great use our binary engines to perform a binary computation or to perform multi-bit computations in some sort of a bit sequential uh, way. So that's what we can do, recover, maintain efficiency, and also recover generality. Now, this is an example of an accelerator that implements this concept. As you can see, you have an array of computational blocks. Each block is a binary convolution engine. Now, if you wanted to use this as a binary convolution engine, you will just take, implement all the binary products and then sum them together. Otherwise, if you want to have a multi-bit configuration, then you can uh, use the scale and add units to actually take the products at various bits, at various uh, level of weights, and then uh, do the shifts, uh, right shifts, and add with the proper amount of right shift to obtain a uh, multi-bit uh, computation. Now, what is the energy efficiency that you can have with this specialized engine? In general, it is uh, around 10 to 20 X more energy efficient to the processor at the same accuracy. Of course, if you go to lower accuracy like binary, your, uh, and you specialize, your efficiency will be better. Also, this is actually open source hard. Now, summarize the view about the acceleration, we move from a um, 20 cojoule uh, per uh, in a processor to a couple of picojoules with um, accelerations and ISA based acceleration to a fraction of picojoule with a configurable data path to single digit uh, femtojoules uh, when we do fully specialized ternary data path. So we have a spectrum of solutions that trade off flexibility for efficiency, and all of them can work together in this uh, flexible architecture. Now, everything together, this is Vega, a uh, IoT processor. This uh, fundamentally is a fully featured TinyML chip that can do all what I described, multi-precision uh, computations using hardware acceleration engines, but also floating point computations using the processors, as well as integer and 8-bit computations using the processor. It has a several acceleration engines, but I also want to focus on the fact that it has also non-volatile efficiency, efficient memory in the chip, and actually a fairly large and dense one based on MRAM. In this way, we can run a um, reasonable size neural network for the tiny space on a single chip without ever going to access our weights outside. This brings our efficiency in the teraops per watt space without compromising flexibility. And in fact, thanks to the on-chip memory, uh, when we can contain all our weights on the on-chip memory, we have an improvement of a factor of three with respect an architecture that needs to tile the memory access using outside memories. And so it has a much lower energy efficiency. Now, I would like to move from the 
um, low power to the high performance space. Now, in the high performance space, for example, machine learning training, your workload requires floating point. And the basic idea is let's try to leverage the same concepts as we leveraged in pulp. So for, uh, fundamentally, let's try to uh, remove the fact that we have this uh, core bottleneck uh, in the data and uh, in accessing the data and actually use a core to uh, manipulate a set of parallel accelerators like the one that we have described in the previous slides, but in this case, specialized for floating point computations. And the core has more a control function while the FEPUs are given access to the main memory with as an accelerator in parallel. So this is actually an interesting, uh, an interesting uh, view of uh, how we can get better performance in a high performance space, but it's not exactly the same as we did before. Here we have that the single operation unit like an FPU is much larger. We also need more flexibility than uh, just the dot products in our accelerators. So we need to do neural networks, but stencil transforms and so on. So we just need a more flexibility than the type of accelerators we have seen in the past. And also our VDD and F regions are slightly different than in the low power. Here we need more per chip. So we need to operate at a higher, higher frequency. And this means that relatively speaking, our memories, even the nearby memories are slower. So we need to worry about the latency to the memory more than in the low power space. So these are the key differences between uh, moving between being the high, low, per, low power space and being the high performance space. But the key concept of being able to stream data directly from memory through the functional units is a winning concept also in this domain. We did that. And uh, we defined an accelerator specific for uh, uh, memory for a high performance uh, training space called the Network Training Accelerator or NTX. On the other hand, uh, we also have tried to explore uh, the uh, extreme flexibility, how, how to uh, maximize the flexibility of uh, these acceleration engines. And now let's look at the last uh, contribution I want to describe in this talk, which is uh, the Snitch Core. So snitch core is a very counterintuitive for the high performance space, maybe. It's a very tiny, simple, and lightweight control core, microcontroller type, just a few kilogate. But it has been designed in a very streamlined fashion to decode a limited amount of instructions and uh, with very simple microarchitecture, so it can easily achieve a one gigahertz of frequency, even if it is not a uh, super inclined architecture, thanks to its uh, simplicity. Now, this uh, core is also made with an interesting extension with respect to the baseline course we have seen in the previous part of the slide of the presentation, which is a scoreboard. Fundamentally, this is, if you want, is a, is a core that even though it's a super simple, it is able to execute more than one instruction in the clock cycle and tracking dependencies between these instructions. So no renaming, but the dependency tracking and the capability of issuing instructions in parallel. Now, what are the instructions that you can execute in parallel in this tiny core? For sure, the load and store unit and the acceleration instructions. What are the acceleration instructions in this domain? Well, these acceleration instructions are fundamentally floating point operation. And so we see a floating point unit as the accelerator that this core will manage. You may consider that having a core to feed an FPU is an overkill. Why don't we have a single core to feed many FPUs? Well, we would give up flexibility in that case. And also, we will see that by extensions to this score, very simple extension of this score, we are able to provide a very high utilization of the FPU. And most important, the FPU is much, much larger of the core. An FPU is around 80,000 kilogates and the core is around 10,000 kilogates, which fundamentally means 10% uh, of the cost. So the core 
works almost as a, as a control unit of an accelerator, the accelerator being the, F, being the F2. So that's the concept. Now, how can we increase the utilization of the FPU? Remember, the core is issuing instructions and we wanted to achieve the maximum utilization of our FPU. The niche core does this through two main things, stream semantic registers and um, uh, FREP or instruction, uh, floating point instruction sequence. In intuitively, uh, stream semantic registers are an extension to the ISA, which uh, makes uh, load and stores implicit as, as ALU operation to some specific registers. In other words, there are a couple of registers in the architecture that correspond fundamentally to memory ports. And whenever you access these registers, a memory transaction is issued. In other words, we have a aliasing of a uh, um, register access with a um, address generation uh, and uh, load and store operation. Then the uh, um, FRAP or sequencer is fundamentally an internal buffer that allows it to execute a sequence of instruction without having to refetch them over and over again. So these two fundamental ideas added to this niche core can improve the utilization of our accelerator by a significant amount. In the interest of time, let me just uh, fly over what I'm, uh, I'm going to show here, which is uh, our uh, well-known convolutional loop. You see our dot product. And this is our uh, basic RISC-5 instruction set. Now we know how we can make this, this better by the instruction extensions that I illustrated in the previous uh, uh, part of the talk. But let's look at how we can improve efficiency. Note that here the floating point unit is used only for one slot, which is the green slot. All the other Pico jobs are wasted, quote unquote, because of other instructions. So how we can do this? Well, we can improve our efficiency by fundamentally identifying the, the, the hot loop and uh, um, parallelizing the hot loop uh, in integer instruction running into the integer core and floating point instruction running into the uh, floating point unit. So these floating point operations are fundamentally float load and uh, float multiply accumulate. Only 17% 17 of this is useful work. If we actually do ideal loop rolling, we can get to 33% of useful work. But let, let's see what, how we can do better. If we remove the floating point load into the inner loop by our stream semantic registers, we have to set up the stream semantic registers at the beginning of our loop. Then we have the computation. And as you can see from the new sequence here, we don't have the load and stores uh, again. Why? Because every time we access the uh, floating point register, FT0 and FT1, we have our uh, implicit load and store thanks to the stream semantic registers. So now our, uh, our execution uh, achieves one floating point operation. And uh, as you can see here, we are doing 33% of useful work. That is already quite good. But then if we do perfect loop and rolling, so if we eliminate the jump and add the instructions that we need for manipulating the loop, we can achieve 100% useful work. And how we can do this? Well, we can do this with FREP. Fundamentally, FREP is the, con the same concept as a hardware loop, but uh, without fetching instructions. So fundamentally, we are the preparation instruction that tells please repeat the next set of instructions, in this case, one instruction, the FMED, uh, n times where n is the number of iterations that you want. Remember, load and stores are not present before because they have become implicit. And uh, with FREP, we also remove all the uh, boundary, boundary checking and the pointer um, and the loop counter uh, overhead, thanks to this, um, uh, internal hardware loop instruction. 
So finally, we can achieve full utilization of our floating point unit without having increased the complexity of our processor, making it a super scalar or uh, you know, highly predictable or high, highly parallel, but thanks to uh, smart addition of instruction extension. Again, we are using here the flexibility of the RISC-V USA to implement instruction extensions that are general purpose, but lead to the much higher utilization of our functional unit. This gives us at a very modest cost, a very high speed up with respect to the baseline. Move to conclusion. You can see here the extra hardware that we need to add to support SSR. And let me just say that this extra hardware is around um, a few kilobytes, uh, kilo gates per lane. And so it's a very affordable extra cost around the overall 25% of the cost of the processor to have an improvement in instruction in FP's throughput, in floating point throughput of a factor of two. So to summarize, in an eight core cluster, this would be the partition of uh, area and power also. As you can see, uh, you know, this integer or uses a minuscule fraction of the power. The SSR and FREP extra hardware still uses only 5% of the power. And of course, the big amount of the power is in the FU and the L1 memory, which is exactly what we want because this is the unavoidable computation related power. And so we spend the energy where it contributes to the result, which essentially is a synonym of high efficiency. So how do we scale this? from a single eight course to uh, a, a full scale tera operation per second uh, platform. So we go hierarchical. So we have this high efficient compute cluster, and then we subdivide the system hierarchical. This is our cluster, eight cores cluster with uh, the eight floating point units. Then we connect this to a stage one crossbar, which allows the traffic uh, also across the clusters, not only the higher level of the higher. Then we move it to stage two crossbar with uh, um, still high bandwidth, but reduced compared to the cluster to cluster bandwidth. And then we can move to the third stage crossbar. And this is our complete architecture. And finally, the last stage, we can move then to the fourth stage crossbar, which also connects to the high performance, the high bandwidth memory. So in this way, we have a thinning of the bandwidth from the bottom to the top, but at the end, we match the bandwidth available at the memory system in the S4 level of the interconnect, the fourth level of interconnect. This hierarchical architecture is called a manticore and can scale up to 4,000 Courts, so multi tera opt uh, architecture. This uh, concept of a, a manticore made of uh, three chiplets, each one of them um, connected to a, a eight uh, um, gigabyte HBM2, and the chiplets connected to each other with a super high bandwidth die to die link. Um, based on uh, uh, serial uh, short range links, achieves a 4,000 snitch cores, peak teraflops, eight teraflops, double precision per second. And of course, we need a few uh, control cores to manage that. Now, this is a drawing, but uh, I am happy to say that we are working on a physical realization of this concept. So there is a possibility to apply this instruction specialization and this idea of streaming support for the RISC V architecture to uh, outperform state of art architectures also in the high performance space. Let me now summarize. We are living in a power bound computing world from the IoT to the data center. Performance cannot scale at the price of efficiency because we will hit the power bounds. RISC V is a game changer. Not only it enables open innovation from the risk from the ISA to the microarchitecture, but also gives us for free a software ecosystem and momentum that is a key differentiator for the impact of our research work. 
key ideas that I covered in this, uh, in this presentation are how we remove the von Neumann bottleneck with innovative ISA design, like the XPALP extensions, how we implement domain specific acceleration, avoiding uh, uh, rabbit holes of hyper specialization, like uh, the concept of SSR and FREP, how we can have a latency tolerance uh, to, uh, as a key to support the scalability. And this is the uh, dual issue and the scoreboarding available in this niche. And also the tensor DMA that I didn't have the time to cover in this presentation. And finally, I want to give a hope message. Area and bandwidth are still abundant and will be abundant in the future thanks to new technology, uh, new 3D integration uh, and uh, and the mix of this. So it's going to be fun. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I welcome your question. Thank you very much, uh, Luca. Um, so I think during your talk, during maybe 10% of the time, the audio was not perfect, but I think most of it was understandable, at least from, uh, from my side. Um, I see that there are two questions in the Q&A section. Uh, Luca, maybe you can have a look at that. Yeah. Okay, so the, the first question, I think, uh, from Reiner, uh, it's a it's an excellent question because uh, um, customizing uh, processors uh, using AZIP uh, technology has been done for the next for the last 20 years, and uh, and it's a common practice. So um, that is uh, uh, definitely, if you want, uh, in a sense, uh, to see it this way. We are applying AZIP uh, uh, ideas to, um, to the RISC-V baseline ISA. So that's uh, fundamentally, if you want, uh, um, another way to say, to, to, to see the problem that we are looking at. There are also a bit of, a, of a differences because uh, fundamentally here, we are also heavily in interacting with the semantic of the instruction is not only specialized instruction for a specific domain, but we are also adding access to the memories, the microarchitecture extensions that come with instruction, for example, the loop buffers and so on. So fundamentally, we are using uh, all a set of techniques that we have also seen in microarchitectural specialization of, uh, of the course, uh, targeting them to the uh, instruction set, not only, not specifically only uh, instruction for, you know, a, a different uh, ALU for a different type of applications, but really is uh, AZIP uh, in the fullest sense. So including also a uh, redesign of the microarchitecture of the pipeline. So fundamentally, uh, yes, uh, there are also more radical approaches like uh, memory and, and neuromorphic uh, now, uh, that's a very long discussion. I think that uh, some of these approaches have a lot of promise and we are exploring them. But uh, currently, I still think that uh, in the general purpose or you know, in the domain specific architecture, these approaches are still a bit narrow. Now, will, will, they, will they become completely uh, competitive to the traditional computing architecture like we have seen today? Maybe in the long term, but not now. Uh, so there is another question uh, on slide 30, the FPU uh, can bypass the register file. Oh, that's a good question. So um, the, um, actually the idea here is that the um, FPU has uh, in the RIS-5 instruction set has its own register file. Okay, so in, in this case, uh, we are actually having the, um, we are actually having the stream semantic registers connected to the FPU. So they are um, the stream ports into the memory system are connected to floating point register. So in this sense, uh, the in integer register file, that is the one that is managed for instruction in, for uh, the integer instructions in the snitch core is bypassed because the, the stream semantic uh, registers are injecting uh, the results of the load directly into the memory system. Sorry, in the uh, floating point register. Uh, 
I have another question, uh, Luca. So uh, how far are you from doing the processing in the memory itself? Mm -hmm. Okay, yes, I, I think that's a very interesting direction. And um, so the, uh, the idea of doing the processing in the memory, um, so there are many, many uh, shades of this idea. So it could be another, another talk. So uh, one shade of this idea is to actually create a, a very large, um, you know, bandwidth to your uh, uh, floating point or to your operational units. And, uh, and this is, if you want more a uh, near memory. So we, you can put your or operating uh, your, um, your floating point units or your integer units close to a memory arrays uh, up to the periphery of the memory arrays. And this is actually uh, doable. And many of the architectures we have described here are suitable for doing that because uh, we have a full control of the, um, of the microarchitecture. So fundamentally, nothing prevents us to uh, attach uh, these values and processors very close to the memory. So, uh, in a sense, uh, having uh, this uh, merge of the processor into the memory array is possible, but this I call it near memory. Now, in memory means uh, using the uh, circuit structures of the memory for performing some co type of computations. This is also possible. It requires a mix of signal processing, and we are working, we are looking into that. But I have to say that in many cases, the payoff for doing this is interesting, but not heart shattering. And the reason is that sooner or later, you have to go back into the digital domain. And then, in a sense, you are going to pay the conversion price from moving from the mix of signal operations to the full uh, uh, digital operation. This conversion price uh, is quite expensive. And uh, for many computation, it uh, kills your efficiency. So it's an interesting game to play, but I'm not, uh, uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that will not, uh, you know, make uh, the near memory computing obsolete. Okay. So I see there's one more question, last question, because I know we have to leave. But before going to the last question, I want also want to announce that there will be a Gather Town session after this. So Eniko will put the link in the chats. So if you want to join us, feel free to join us. Maybe you can look at the last question from Mahmoud. Um, Luca? Yeah. Okay, so I, I think that the, mm, not completely sure I understand the, the question, but uh, let's say, um, I think that RIS-5 uh, as a normal load and store architecture can benefit, uh, per, can benefit from uh, cache-based optimizations like they have been done for decades uh, for, uh, you know, ARM uh, x86 and so on. So in this case, uh, RIS-5 is no different. What makes, in my view, RIS-5 extremely interesting and, I shown, and I've shown a couple of examples in this uh, talk, is that uh, if you couple the fact that you have an open ISA with the fact that with RIS-5, you can create open architectures. So you, you can have open uh, designs, open RTL and so on, then uh, it gives you a degree of freedom of really playing with the microarchitecture implementation of your course which you cannot usually do with uh, the uh, classical established instruction sets that are proprietary. For example, for doing an optimization like string semantic registers, just to give you one example, um, which is a bit orthogonal to a cache, you could attach a string semantic register to a cache, not to a scratch pad, no difference. But to do this type of optimization, you will need to have an open uh, available RTL, a micro architectural pipeline of your core in order to uh, make this uh, uh, implementation. Because as you have seen, it, it's really attaching something to the register file of your architecture. So cannot be done as a memory uh, out of a memory shell interface to a memory bus and things like that. So how can you do this with a proprietary architecture where the microarchitecture is a trade secret? It's impossible. So I think that the key idea of RISC-5 is not just the open 
openness of the architecture, of openness of the ISA, but it also allows people to develop a course that are fully open and aligned with the architecture so that people can work and optimize with the inner core of the microarchitecture, with, uh, which is not possible with proprietary cores, especially in the high performance. Okay. With this answer, I think we can close the session. So let me thank you again, Luca, for this uh, inspiring keynote. Yeah. Um, um, and uh, well, everybody who wants to join us in the Gather Plan session after this uh, keynote is welcome to join us. Thank you very much. And the uh, next event is the webinar. I think it's next Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. You're also welcome in that uh, webinar. Thank you. Have a nice evening and maybe talk to you. Bye bye, everybody. Bye.